Willie Gistick, Epsidwen, Delawazi, Kathy Martin, Lustigush Deleoi, Akwigi. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Kathy Martin, National Chief Candidate from the Lustigush Mi'kmaq Nation. Before I begin, um, I really like to express my mixed emotions about the timing of the AFN National Chief Election. As you know, our First Nations are currently in crisis, and we need to acknowledge the trauma and re-traumatization of our families, communities, and nations with the recovering of the 1,500 children who are victims of the residential institutions across this country. And in addition, currently, our brothers and sisters in British Columbia are battling widespread fire, loss, amidst, uh, all amidst uh, extreme heat conditions. And not to mention our First Nation communities are still at various levels within this pandemic. And in, in addition, the realities of the virtual election present many difficulties in and of itself. So my thoughts and energies are truly with our nations during this challenging time. I realize many of our chiefs are in survival mode for their communities at this moment. Thus, it's not an optimal time for an election. However, it is during this critical time that strong and sensible leadership is needed. That being said, this election for a national chief is not about celebration and honor, but rather a time for humbleness and responsibility. So thank you for listening for that. And I'd like to take an opportunity to tell you a bit about myself as a candidate for national chief. So in addition to being a grassroots politician, I'm a mother and a grandmother, and I'm also an academic. I was raised and resided most of my life in the Listowish Mi'kmaq First Nation. I have a doctorate degree in educational leadership from the University of Phoenix, but as well, I remain receptive and respectful of our traditional knowledge holders. I am currently an elected member of Council, Council for the Listowish Mi'kmaq government, and I've been involved in politics for over 20 years both with traditional politics and elected politics. I previously served two terms as the elected chief councillor. I currently remain the council representative for the tri-council of the Mi'kmaq of the Gaspe Z. And as such, I sat on the Mi'kmaq Constitution Building Committee for the Mi'kmaq Nation of Gaspe. I continue to uphold productive communications with our Mi'kmaq hereditary chief of the 7th District Council. I'm also a published author. I launched my latest publication, Strengthening Canadian Indigenous Relations and Decision-Making Processes in June of 2019. I wrote this book as a tool based on research intrinsic of my own personal political experiences in combination with scientific research on successful implementation of community-driven plans. This book is a contrast of holistic and hierarchical value systems and offers framework solutions for helping improve not only the intergovernmental relationships, but professional relationships within our communities and within ourselves as First Nation politicians. The solutions presented in my book are frameworks that I designed to address the unique needs of the, and diversity within each of our First Nation communities for addressing issues with a community-driven approach. As National Chief, these frameworks and my skills will be beneficial in guiding the Chief's discussions by allowing them to create solutions for the issues unique to their diverse needs, as well as address the national issues we face as First Nations. Since my nomination in mid-May, uh, I've been sending bi-weekly emails to the majority of the Chiefs. Uh, included in there were some uh, uh, two short minute videos on, on a number of topics. Uh, I also included in those emails uh, a copy of my resume uh, for the chiefs to review so you can uh, review uh, my competencies and see my uh, political accomplishments, uh, how many boards and committees I, I sit on, uh, my volunteer efforts at the grassroots level. Um, it has a detail of my education and uh, awards and uh, it has a, a detail of my work experience. So you can see that I have worked in Canada coast to coast uh, uh, providing presentations. I've uh, worked in every uh, province uh, in this country, uh, mainly in First Nation communities, uh, delivering uh, workshops and different things. So uh, that, that's for your review. So I don't have to uh, explain a lot of 
that in this uh, limited time presentation. So um, the two short minute, uh, the, the short two minute videos, I should say, uh, included a number of topics. Uh, so I'm just going to briefly uh, read through the, the topics that uh, I've included in. Um, I spoke about inclusivity and its importance, systemic racism, wellness in our communities, effective communication as the AFN chief, influencing legislation, implementing change, building relationships, and the economy. And so I'd like to highlight a few of these topics today. And the first is uh, I'll talk about is systemic racism. And the reason I choose systemic racism is because the majority of issues we currently face as First Nation people are based on systems developed to exclude and control us by external governments and organizations. Systemic racism is the underlying cause of the majority of common issues we face as First Nation people in Canada. It includes everything from underfunded service programs to blatantly racially motivated actions against our people by justice, security, and external governments. Systemic racism is evident at all levels of government and within organizations that interact with us. Our people continue to suffer the injustices that result from frontline workers in health, justice, education, as well as in the public service, service sector. And even more disturbing, Systemic racism exists with decision makers who unilaterally develop regulations with their perspective of resource management. So that is why it's so important for our people to have input and be at the decision making tables with upper level policy makers. Not to negotiate what's already ours, but to increase the understanding of our inherent rights and cultural practices and to provide meaningful input to policy and legislation within the provinces and Canada. And even more important is the conveyance of respect that we are all diverse First Nations who have been grouped in terms of legislation, but we are diverse nations with diverse needs, cultural practices and rights. The century and a half of systemic racism has significantly impacted the well-being of our nations. Rates of suicide remain high, addictions are increasing, mental health, depression, and lateral violence is rampant in our communities. And many of our First Nation languages are facing extinct, extinction. These are without a doubt the result of intergenerational trauma experienced by our ancestors at the hands of external governments that imposed and accepted systems of racism against our people. And there is no greater reminder of this than the recent horrific discovery of the 1,500 plus unrecorded burials of children who were stolen from their families, kept in residential schools, abused physically, emotionally, sexually, and murdered. Healing is needed in our communities to restore wellness. The rediscovery of our lost children has finally given the validation to the voices of our ancestors and survivors of Canada's residential institutions. Apologies are not enough, and accountability from the Canadian government and the Christian churches is essential for our healing processes. Liability discussions need to be had. Our relationship with Canada has always been just a legal one. Agreements and treaties are embedded in the Constitution. Now, with the horrific proof, discussions of liability need to be had to implement the healing that comes from us for us. Healing must come from within, not externally. We can't rely on external governments to solve our problems. However, having the Canadian government and the Christian churches accept the responsibility for their actions is vital to our healing processes. And the AFN can help assure accountability measures are implemented. And we also need to start to unravel the systemic racism found in the current legislation and modern day treaty processes. The Assembly of First Nations through the National Chief can bring to light our rights as inherent title holders to our unceded lands and resources by promoting appreciation and recognition of our legal rights and history, not only with Canada, but also with the Crown, with whom many of our nations already have established historic treaties. The current modern day treaty negotiation system being implemented is colonialistic. Whereas it denies our nations the liberty to discuss amongst our nations 
or with other First Nations who have been through similar processes. This process of secrecy and exclusion is of little to no benefit for our First Nations and does not respect our values of inclusivity, responsibility, and seven generational planning. So in our efforts to address systemic racism, we often target the results. We, we, we look at the lower levels. We, we start to target inadequate housing, water, infrastructures, education, health, and other services. Uh, and we target the results of maltreatment of our people uh, by institutions of justice and security. And as such, we tend to lobby for increased funding, recognition, and inclusion in service agreements. But what we really need to discuss at the assembly is addressing the systems. The systemic racism is at the root, which is at the legislation level that was developed by the external provincial and federal governments with little or no recognition of our treaty rights. Our treaties in unceded territories are the foundation for which Canada was built. Our treaties supersede legislation. And in order to get this recognized, we need to continue to assert our inherent rights to our lands and resources in the laws of the land that we have followed since time immemorial. We're not breaking any laws, but rather demonstrating how exclusion of us in Canadian lawmaking creates conflict. Another suggestion I offer for the chiefs to consider stems from my value of inclusivity. I'm suggesting that the chiefs reevaluate the charter of the AFN that was adopted in 1985 in its original intent. The Assembly of First Nations is just that, an assembly. It's an organization that was designed to allow us to gather and to discuss the issues we face as First Nation while respecting the individuality and diversity of each nation. And within the charter, tolerance and respect are the foundations for coming together to strengthen and maintain our inherent rights and traditions while we work with other governments to continue closing the gap between our nations and mainstream Canadians. But I also believe that there is no better time than now to begin forming alliances between our traditional governing systems and our elected governing systems within each nation. I think of us in terms of sweetgrass as we are all rooted in the lands of our nation. And when we braid sweetgrass, it creates strength, both spiritually and physically. In our communities, we are of all the same nation in which the imposition of an elected governing system has caused a divide. And both our traditional and elected governments have legal recognition and forming alliances will only strengthen our power as First Nations. So I think it's time to have discussions to redefine and realign the Assembly of First Nations to ensure inclusivity when discussing ways to promote the political, economic, and social advancement of our individual sovereign nations. So the strategic approach that I'm advocating for as National Chief is based again on my research, intrinsic of my own political experiences, in combination with the scientific research on successful implementation of community-driven plans. My specialty as a curriculum developer is taking any goal and objective from here and bringing it to realization over here in a step-by-step -step process that entails rights holders' inputs, stakeholders' inputs, our community members, our elected and traditional governing bodies, our elders, and it has consideration of the effects on the surrounding communities, considerations of our urban indigenous, our resources and environment, our legislations, financial implications, and future generations. So my strategies for fame frameworks is based on research, and they're found within my publication, uh, Strengthening Canadian Indigenous Relations. So do I have all the answers uh, how to address things? Absolutely not. But I know where the answers lay, and the answers lay within each and every First Nation community in this country. And the AFN can help by developing frameworks that address the specific issues that are inclusive of each diverse nation's input and in consideration of all factors involved. So let me explain how we can get started once elected as national chief. We can begin by hosting a special assembly at the end of summer or early fall. 
And the first topic that we need to discuss at this assembly is um, a discussion on Canada's genocide actions. We also need to discuss addressing the structural needs of the AFN. We need to evaluate uh, the charter. We need to look at uh, the regional chiefs and the executive and the subcommittees and, and see how this all fits uh, together. We need to start uh, some legislation reform, targeting systems and, and determining priorities of, of how we are going to do that and which systems we're going to target first. We can discuss building relationships within community and between First Nations and external governments. And within this uh, initial General Assembly, we can begin by responding to legislation uh, such as uh, Bill 96, C-10, UNDRIP, Bill C-92, or any other bill that uh, the Assembly has concerns about. So in closing, let me say that I'm blessed to be amongst the seven candidates offering for National Chief. We all have passion and we all have strong leadership skills. But this election is not about us, the candidates. It's not about our visions and our dreams. The election is about every First Nation person in this country as they are represented by you, their elected chiefs of this nation. As chiefs, you are tasked with the decision to cast your vote, to decide who will best represent your voice and your decisions. You're going to decide who can best convey your collective message to the external governments and Canadians. Decide who can best facilitate prosperity and economic growth within our nations. You need to decide who can best advocate for community wellness, health, security, education, environment, social and social issues. You need to decide who can best preserve and inform about our inherent rights, our historical treaties, and the modern day treaty process, and who can best represent and serve as a role model with traditional holistic values. So my goal entering in this election has always been to gain the ear of the chiefs and to share my gifts and knowledge for the betterment of our nations. This campaign process has been both exhilarating and humbling. And I'm ready to accept that challenge, dedication and determination to facilitate and implement the direction of you, our chiefs. But despite the results of the vote, I remain thankful for the experience as this election is not about me. It's about the population of First Nation people in this country that you represent. Walaliok. <laughs>